Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Welcome everybody to the Safina Saadi Nothing But Facts live stream as we come to you on a cold Monday morning after uh, a really cold uh, Sunday as well on a day in which if you're like Madiki Click and you're from Minnesota, you must be miserable because your team did it again. They blew it. They had such a great season. M- Maliki Click, are you watching this? They had such a great season, the Minnesota Vikings. And they just basically showed up a dud and a game that should have been theirs against a team that hasn't won a playoff game since 2011. Who knows when? But uh, the r- people from Minnesota, which is Maliki Click, is one of them. And he's a, a Viking, and he's actually a Viking. You know that? He's actually a Norwegian. And they're called the Vikings in Minnesota because there was such a Norwegian migration there, right? And the Chargers, yeah, the Chargers blew a big game, but they weren't expected to go far. But the Vikings were so good this year. And they had the game of the year against the Bills. It was such an exciting game. And then all of a sudden they come in and against the Giants, basically, like, how, how do you not take over that game? They have many opportunities to do so. But the Giant fans here in New Jersey are extremely pumped. I don't really care about football, except that I do care about, I love watching the reactions of the playoffs. Uh, probably by tomorrow, you maybe you'll see some, I don't know if this was worthy of smashing TVs. You guys remember that? Smashing TVs. Oh, you don't, okay, so like last last minute, they miss a play, mess up, and the fans would like smash their TV and stuff like that. They go crazy. They go crazy. Anyway, that is uh, what's on the mind of some people today. Uh, today we have Sheikh Yahi Rodas on segment numero uh, three segments we have today. We have our reading from uh, uh, from Surah Al-Ma'arij, Asbab al-Nuzul, Surah Al-Ma'arij, but I first want to make a comment about Surah, uh, some Surah Nuh. We're then going to re- take your comments and questions a little bit. Then we're going to talk to Sheikh Yahya, and that'll take us to the end of today's program. And let's start with Surah Nuh. has in it some ayat that are so important for everybody to know. The Sayyidina Jafar al-Sadiq was asked one time about uh, having a child. I want to have a child. He said, make istighfar. Or sorry, it was Hassan al-Basri. Hassan Basri, make istighfar. So Hassan Basri was then, um, another person came and said, I, I need r- uh, rizq, wealth. So he said, go make istighfar. So uh, another man came and he said, I'm trying to buy a new house. He said, make istighfar. Obviously, this is over a period of time. So his students, they said, I think, do you just tell everyone make istighfar? Is that, that's it? He said, no. He said, no, you haven't read the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا This series of ayah tells us the power of istighfar, but it has to be a lot of istighfar. It has to be a lot of uh, uh, tawbah. So let's list the things that are mentioned in this. فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا That's the first thing. It would rain on you. Now, that rain is of course useful for the farmer, useful for the, for the people who need water, but it's allegorical to everyone else. Okay. So how is rain, for example, a reward for someone in England? Right? It's not. He rain, gets rain all the time. So that rain, يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا As-sama. So the, it means here that rizq, rizq. And when it says yursil as-sama, meaning it's going to come in a noble way from above and an unexpected way. Okay? That's the allegory here. Yursil as-sama alaykum madara. Wa yamdidkum bi amwal. And if you want something more explicit that it means wealth, Allah literally says, He will give you money. Amwal, wabanin, children. 
jannat anhar. What is the difference between that? You can have a lot of money and a lot of kids and be miserable, right? But Allah says here, you get you have a jannah, many jannats. It doesn't just mean gardens because if you're someone outside the agricultural world, you don't need a garden, right? Jannat here, like your home, it could be a paradise. It's not everyone's home, right? It could be a paradise. So that you could have a lot of money, you could have a lot of kids, but your home is not a paradise. It's not a place of rest. It's not a place of happiness. Okay? It's a place of distress. It could be. So Allah says, it's a jannah. Now, if you have a great home and you got all these wonderful things, okay, don't you have to keep, upkeep it? So Allah says, you get anhara, rivers. And the river, the idea of the river is that it's a free, rivers are free. It's not anything that you have to pay for. Yet at the same time, it comes to you, okay, and it nourishes your, your garden. So the allegory for that is that it's a constant income. Like a river is a constant free food for your garden, right? It's free uh, feeding of your garden, irrigation. Likewise, it's an income. So amwal, a one-time. Anhara, constant income. Constant passive income. So this is something that you have to always keep in mind. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مُدْرَارُمْ تِتْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا Okay. Uh, this set of ayats, you should always recite from it. So keep in mind that as long as a person is constantly in a state of uh, istighfar, right, constantly in a state of istighfar, then they will be receiving all of these gifts. And now... I like to take this in another way, from another perspective. From another angle, you could say, why is there a material explanation for this? And I think there is. If you're a person of istighfar, then you're a person of humility. You're a person who believes that there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things, right? And you're humble enough to recognize that. Well, if that's what you do in your spiritual life, wouldn't that trickle down into all your other lives? If I'm always making tawbah, that means I'm recognized there's a right way to act with Allah, if there's a wrong way to act. And for every time I do something wrong, I repent. Okay? If that's what you do with your creator who's unseen to you, chances are it's going to trickle down to everything else. Chances are the mentality of a Muslim when he comes to work, he's going to have the same legalistic fiqhi mindset that's going to say there's, there are necessary things to do, there are things we should never do, there are things it's good for us to do, but it's not the priority, and things good for us to leave off, and then there's a lot of things in the middle. Once you take that mentality, and that when I make a mistake in work, I got to repent for it, I got to make up for it. It's, it's a trickle-down of that mentality, of the fiqhi mentality, of that there's, there are right ways and there wrong ways to do things. And I'm not a fan of the new world that, where people are now changing all the rules. As soon as they start failing, they change the rules, right? So now, like, like as soon as people get lazy, let's say, you know, in some sphere of life, they take something that was always considered bad, such as, and I really don't want to offend anyone, but obesity is not good for you. Allah never made you that way, right? It's not good for you. But now we're turning this into beauty. We're turning it into like, it's okay. Where it's not even good for your heart. It's not good for anything. Point being is that the, the Muslim mentality is going to be that there are rights and wrongs and there are levels of gray. And there's, in the middle, pure gray. That's the halal. You do it, don't do it, doesn't make a difference, right? Then there's light gray and dark gray. Then there's black and there's white. That's the gradient that we live on, our, li our lives on. And if you're humble enough, you, si you accept the system, and then you say, I can't live up to it. I failed. And then you try to live up to it. And you keep trying to live up to it. But you don't change the system. Which, like reformist Muslims, progressive Muslims and reform Muslims, by the way, I'm, I'm going to, I'll talk about this another time. I've accepted a rare invitation to, to a, a university here in America to speak about 
is Islam, is it necessary to believe in the Prophet That's the lecture, right? Is it necessary to believe in the Prophet Or can you just hear about him and respect him and move on with your life? That's the lecture I'm giving. Qat'iyat. Qat'i. This is qat'i. There's no discussion on it, right? You don't discuss qat'iyat. There's no madhabs in qat'iyat. There's no madhab on if the sun rises from the east or the west. So my message to not that group, because they're, they're being nice to me, that group, to be honest with you, right? They want me to hear my perspective. They're being fair. At least they're inviting somebody, right, to offer the other perspective. But anyway, set that aside. Reform Muslims, progressive Muslims. Who are you fooling? The system is this. There are known things. There are known prohibitions. Okay, either you live up to it or you don't. If you don't live up to it, it's better to, it's easier on your conscience to accept that, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and try to do better next time. Okay? But what you don't want to do is alter the system and change the whole religion. Who are you fooling? That's my question. How do you sleep at night? You're not fooling anybody. Are you think you're fooling the angels? Are going to be duped? Are you going to fool Allah? Or are you just fooling yourself? It's actually just what Allah says. Okay? They try to fool the believers. They, f- they f- try to fool Allah. They end up fooling themselves. And that's the thing with the progressive movement. I would much rather take bozos, failures in religion, who are honest, who just fail at their deen all the time, but they're not trying to alter it. I'll take them a thousand times over a, a person who's maybe halfway there, but they alter right, what the deen is supposed to be. And qat'iyat are explicit things. You cannot change the meaning of them. There is no madhab in this. A man once said to me, we really don't know what religion is right. We have four madhabs in Islam, in fiqh, so why don't we have treat all the madhabs, the religions, as madhabs? Right? The answer to it is that we have madhabs and opinions on texts that are dhanni in nature. Meaning, they may possess possible different meanings. The language allows for that flexibility. We do not have madhabs in that which is explicit. Right? There's no madhab in that. There are defaults in all fields. In every field, there are defaults. You don't discuss them. In the medical field, you need your heart to survive. You don't discuss this, right? You don't discuss certain basics that the heart pumps, okay? And the lungs breathe air. And the eyes see and the ears hear. There's no discussion on this. There's probably tons of discussion on other things, like what's the purpose of the appendix, right? They don't even have a name for it. They call it the extra one. That's all it is. The appendix literally means the extra thing. So this is the concept and idea that I believe that there is a material basis for this, rooted in this spiritual practice, that if you live a life of istighfar, then you are implying that you believe in a right and a wrong, and you submit to the idea that you have made a mistake, and you try to rectify your mistake. That's going to trickle down to your family life. It's going to trickle down to your, uh, your personal life, your business life, your education. It's going to trickle down to everything. And you will not, you'll be a person who cannot stand to enter into any field without knowing what are the necessities, what are the prohibitions, right? What do we do? What do we not do? What is close to that? And then what is totally permitted? You're going to walk into everything with that, right? And then when you make a mistake, you fix it. So your worldly life should get a lot better. If you notice, what does he mention here? He mentions here your, your money and your family. That's all happiness is, right? Your money and your family. And in another ayah, he gives you a long life. Okay? The ayah before it. All right? Where is it? Worship this Lord. Make tawbah. Allah give you a long life. So your health, your wealth, and your family. And if you're good with your family, chances are you're going to have a lot of friends, right? It's easier to be friends with people than to be family members. You don't pick your family, but you pick your friends, right? So it's so much easier to, to live 
if your if your family life is good, I can't see I can't imagine a guy who has the patience to be with his family. He takes care of them and doesn't have friends, right? I don't see that. So you've got your health, your wealth, your f- family, and your friends. What else do you need in life? And it's all because of the mentality that there is a right way to do things, there's a wrong way to do things. And when I'm wrong, I admit that I'm wrong and I rectify. If you do this everywhere in life, at every field, you're going to succeed. And what does Allah tell us for those who are addicted to sins? You don't stop, you keep going. Even if you have to, Prophet Sallallahu said, even if you, may, if you fail 70 times in a single day, I don't see anyone who's, who, who fails. There's not even time to fail 70 times in a day. So the Prophet I said, I'm saying 70 times in a single day, you go back. You don't alter what's right and what's wrong. And you don't create some theory that justifies your behavior. And th- isn't that what people do when they fail? Everyone these days is watching the Madoff fix on Netflix, four-part series, right? where the guy had a legit business, but he had this weird thing where he just took everyone's money uh, and opened a side business that was totally illegal, and he never invested the money. And he ended up... Ahmed, you never heard of Madoff? You've never heard of Madoff? How much pharmacy have you been studying? You have... How old are you? In 2008, how old were you? Oh, that's why you didn't hear of him. Okay, you got to pass. Okay, so 2008, the whole, um, the entire uh, uh, economy burst. And this guy, turned out he was doing a fraud for 40 years, right? A Ponzi scheme. Well, what ends up happening is that he takes people's money and he says he's going to invest them. Well, he ends up having, you know, some guys print fake uh, uh, trades, Fake trades by going on by looking at the the uh, the trade the, the market and then printing the trade as if he had made the trade earlier so it always makes him look like he's profiting so he's running a profit this guy's running a consistent profit for thirty years it doesn't ever happen right but anyway he gets such a reputation everyone starts giving him the money he starts living with that money and anyone who wants to pull out. He has plenty of money. He just gives them money and leaves. And then he gets a new investor. That's what a Ponzi scheme is. There's actually no investment happening. Okay? It's just... It, 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 it's impossible for a person to do this if they're habituated to a belief where there is constant right and constant wrong and you're always repenting for your wrong. But this guy goes and he does it. And it's, in, it's insane the way uh, uh, he goes about this because the money reached Europe. They were giving him money from Europe. The amount of money, take a wild guess how much money he ended up having. At the highest point. 30 million. What do you say? 50 billion. 50 billion. How does this happen? How do you sleep at night? And none, not a penny of these people's money is invested. In England, did you guys hear Bernie Madoff? You guys, I'm not even that old. What's with you people? You guys have never heard of Bernie Madoff. I'm not even old. Okay, Bernie Madoff is a Wall Street, he was of not just a veteran, highly respected gold standard Wall Street personality. That's what he was. Because he had a legitimate business. Then in the basement, or a couple stories down, he had this fraud that he was running. Why was he running the fraud? I guess he just got caught up in it, and he just couldn't get out of it. It was the weirdest thing. The, the salaries for the people who were running the fraud was about $5 million bucks a year to run the fraud, which is basically they come in, work full-time, printing fake... Uh, investments fake investments and then mailing them out to people it's like man if you're that good why don't you run a legit business subhanallah but the, that's the concept I love this concept that if you live a life where every time you enter into a, a, uh, something you ask yourself what is necessary 
What's fard? What's forbidden? Let me get that down first. Then I add a layer. What is good to, to do, but not necessary? And what's bad to do, but if I fall into it, it uh, it's not going to be the end of the world. And then what is permitted? When you get a job, you go in that. When you go to college, you go in with that mentality. Everywhere you go, you go with that mentality. And then you go with the mentality that every time I dip into what is forbidden, right, I got to come back. Or else I'm going to get burned. Okay. So this is the biggest uh, fraud, biggest scam, biggest Ponzi scheme in, in world history. World history. $50 billion Ponzi scheme. He went to jail and he died, and his wife killed herself. Yeah. His wife had zero clue that he's been doing this. Zero. How do you live? How do you sleep? Everything about this guy's life was a lie. And I've seen shiuch who live by this. There are necessities, there are prohibitions. Even their nightstand. Like I've spent some time in hotel rooms with shiuch. The nightstand would not go to sleep until he finds everything and fixes his nightstand. Necessity, right? <laughs> not going to say who the sheikh was, but I spent time and I said, and we just came back, we're exhausted, we're going to bed, and he won't sleep. I said, what's going on? He said, um, I don't know what he had. He had usually has three things on his nightstand. I was like, just get it in the morning. He's like, no, it's the principle of it, right? Now, someone who acts like that in the minor things probably acts like that in his organization. That's why they succeed. So that's uh, my takeaway from Surat Nuh and the power of istighfar that it leads you to a respectable and honorable life, a good life. And istighfar here meaning the general concept of tawbah. And you can't make tawbah if you don't know fiqh, Right? That's why you have to know fiqh. You can't be pious if you don't know fiqh. Because what is piety? Piety is saying no to my ego and, and, and pushing it to do what God wants rather than what I want. And Allah only asks us to do that a couple times, right? It's not every day that we have to fight against our nafs. Okay? Unless the society actually tempts us away from that. But uh, the deen of Allah is easy. Society may be corrupt, but the deen is easy. But that concept... If you live that concept, you, you got to be successful. It's impossible you're not going to be successful. Surah Al-Ma'arij. There was no asbab al nuzul for Surah Nuh. وأخرج النساء وابن أبي حاتم عن ابن عباس في قوله سأل سائل قال هو للنظر ابن الحارث. What did he ask? He asked, Is there a punishment? When is this punishment? And he said, Allahumma in kana hadha huwa al-haq min indika fa amtur alayna hijaratan min as-sama. How, how blinded can you get? He says, this uh, another ibn al-Harith, he says, if this is true, in kana hadha min indillah, if this is true, if this deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is true, fa amtur alayna hijaratan min as-sama. Bring down let it rain rocks on our head. Well, shouldn't you say, if this is true, guide us to it? Right? You see, when someone gets blinded, they will not benefit from an open check. Did not Iblis receive an empty check from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Iblis was expelled from paradise. And then he said, oh, hold on. I worshipped for 10,000 years. Where is my compensation? For 10,000 years of worship, and you're, so he knows the divine system of justice. There's no bad thing that you will suffer except you'll get an expiation for that. There's no good thing that you're going to do except that Allah will give you some reward in this life or the next. It, there's no guarantee it's going to be in the next, but you'll definitely get it either in this life. Okay, for If you don't believe in the next life, you'll, you'll get it in this life. So all the people, you, you know what a... What a uh, atheist once said, okay, what about all these, a these, these people who do good things like Bill Gates? I said, why are they doing them? Right? They said, no, they just do it for the sake of the good. I said, they don't want any reward? They said, no. So then why are you asking for one? Right? 
What about Bill Gates and in, in, in going to um, the afterlife and getting no reward for it? Did he want it? Did he ask for it? Why would you get something you don't ask for? Likewise, a person came to me, and, and many, and I'm answering this because it is a theological question. A lot of people ask this. Ask this. There is a woman. She doesn't pray. She doesn't do anything in the deen. She is essentially a zero in the deen. But she lives her whole life raising money for cancer. She's Muslim, right? But she doesn't do anything in the deen. And someone said to me, do you think that this is an expiation for all her other things that she doesn't do? I said, if she intends it. And, she th- and, and then the person went on, like, do you really think that she would be held against her, that she didn't fast or pray because of all this stuff that she's doing, right? On, in, on, in, in the akhirah. I said, well, is she doing it for that reason? Why is she doing it? That is where she's going to get the reward from. Why do you want her to get a reward that she herself doesn't want? Ask her why is she doing it. If she says, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah, then that must, if that's true, it must trickle down eventually to her personal worship of Allah. Otherwise, it's a lie. Okay? If you're doing something for the sake of Allah, well, Allah also told you to do things in your personal life. Right? Dress like this, pray like this, fast like that. So you can't tell me that you love Allah so much that you're going to travel the world raising money for cancer and not practice one bit of deen. Right? That's a lie. If it's, but if she's sincere, then she will. Eventually. Eventually. It will come back. And she will benefit. Right? And she will practice what she's supposed to. Because if she's sincere that this is for Allah, then logically, well, Allah also asked me to do this. How many youth out there, they genuinely come into the deen, they love it, but they have bad relations with their parents. And you ask them, what's going on with you? No, no, no. They seem to have a separation. Until they actually advance in the deen, and it trickles down, that hold on, that same purpose that you're doing all these good these things in the msa and going to these classes you're doing that for allah well allah also asks you to take care of your family too to do these mundane things that you might not want to do it has to trickle down okay it has to trickle down if you're sincere so that's the concept here iblis got the he said where's the justice then allah said ask what you wish give him a free check Blank check. What did Iblis say? What should he have said? You had the chance. Say, first thing, forgive me for my sin. Don't be angry with me again. Let me cool down my ego that always wants to be better than Adam. Let me be honored. I'm not going to say, let me be better than Adam. Forget relativity with the others. Let me be honored. Let me be satisfied with your reward. He had a blank check. But Allah Ta'ala knew that he was so blinded and so full of hate that he misused the check. And he said, let me be appear, let me be invisible to the human being. Let me whisper to them from birth to death. Let me be involved in their children and their wealth. And let me live until the day of judgment so that no human being ever lives without me attacking them. That's what he asked for. Likewise, here in Nadr ibn Harith, he has the same disease of the ego. See, we creatures that have free choice, jinn and humans, we can be really irrational. And here, Allahumma in kana hadha huwa al-haqq min indika fa'amtar alayna hijaratin min sama. Oh Allah, if this is true, then let it rain sins upon us. Uh, let, let it rain rocks upon us. Okay. وأخرج ابن أبي حاتم عن السدي قال في قوله سأل سائل قال نزلت بمكة في النظر ابن الحارث when he said اللهم إن كان هذا هو الحق من عندك فامتر علينا حجارة من السماء oh Allah if this is true then bring the punishment now you should say if this is true okay if this is true then forgive me then guide me to it then make me love it ابن عربي he didn't want to ever marry and then he started reading hadith. He sat in a circle of hadith. 
And he said, um, the Sheikh said in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever chooses man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minna. If you think that there's something better than my sunnah and you don't want my sunnah, which is marriage, eating, sleeping, living a regular life, those aspects of life, then you're not one of us. It doesn't mean if you happen not to get married, okay? It means if you think that's better and you don't want the sunnah of the Prophet. So Ibn Arabi was thinking about this for a while and immediately he came to the right answer. He said, oh Allah, I don't want to marry, so change my heart. Let my heart be aligned with the sunnah. So we have to make dua for our hearts sometimes. When you have envy, when you have issues, when you have these other things, when you are competitive, you, when you don't like the will of Allah, you can ask Allah to alter your heart. Surah Al-Haqqah. أخرج ابن جرير وابن أبي حاتم والواحد عن بريدة قال بريدة إز ممنوع من الصرف قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لعلي بن أبي طالب إني أمرت أن أدنيك ولا أقصيك وأن أعلمك وأن تعي وحق لك أن تعي سبحان الله أن الله سبحانه وتعالى سز وتعيها أذن واعية Okay. And this hadith is not sahih, he says. The isnad of this is not sahih. But he's, he cites it. And the reason he cites it uh, is because it's the only thing that comes. It is pr- well known that وَتَعِيَهَا أُذُنُ وَاعِيَا It's Sayyidina Ali. Because the Prophet ﷺ held his ear as his head, he أُذُنُ وَاعِيَا This is an ear that hears. Okay, And you could hear تَسْمَعْ وَلَا تَعِي السَّمَعْ is you hear the sound. Al Wa'i, you got the message. That's the difference. As Sama is you're hearing the sound. Wal Wa'i is you're getting the message. That's the difference. And Sayyidina Ali truly understood it with a depth unlike anybody else. But the hadith says, Oh Ali, I was commanded to bring you near to me, to never let you be far from me, and to teach you. Okay? And that you should grasp what I'm saying. Okay? And it is haqqun laka. It is a right for you or it is um, dutiful for you to listen, okay, to understand. Let's say not even Abi Talib. Surat Noon. Let's see what the asbab al-nuzul is from this. Okay. Akhraja ibn al-Munzir an ibn Jurajin. قال كانوا يقولون للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه مجنون ثم الشيطان. They started off saying that the prophet is مجنون. Well, hold on a second. How can you say on one hand his Quran is poetry and then on the other hand he's مجنون? Have you ever seen a مجنون person produce poetry? So you're contradicting yourselves all the time. So they dropped مجنون. Then they said he's a shaitan. He is connected to the jinn and he has all sorts of uh, connections with these shayateen. And Allah subhanahu brings وَمَا أَنْتَ بِنَعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ نُونَ وَالْقَلَمِ وَمَا يَسْتُرُونَ مَا أَنْتَ بِنَعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَأَجْرٌ وَعَيْنًا وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَأَلَ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٌ Surah Al-Qalam. So, w- does Allah need to tell the Prophet he's Majnoon? It's his, this is consolation. The Prophet is, oh, Allah is consoling the Prophet, okay? not informing him that he's not Majnoon. The Prophet never thought he was Majnoon, right? but he's consoling the Messenger. Constantly in Suyuti's tafsir, he's always mentioning that this is a, like con- consolation. That he's he has very few followers. He's being ridiculed by his people, so Allah consoles him. وأخرج أبو نعيم في الدلائل والواحد بسند وا. He narrates with a weak sanad from Aisha. قالت ما كان أحد أحسن خلقا من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما دعاه أحد من أصحابه 
ولا من اهل بيتي الا قال لبيك سبحان الله وانك لعلى خلق عظيم this is amazing said aisha says no but the prophet never never was invited by anybody in his family they never called him they never asked for him except he said لبيك meaning at your service right at your service he never it says here from ahli bayti wa ashabihi now by the way what are the rules if somebody calls you forget calls you what if someone knocks on your door which means that they it also if they text you if they email you you have zero obligation to answer okay zero obligation to answer the quran says wa qila lakum irji'u irji'u farji'u hu aska lakum if you're told if you knock on someone's house and you are told go back go back it's more pure for you what does it mean it's more pure for you meaning that it humbles you. you're humbled right you accept being rejected right and it's not that we're trying to always be people who are accept being rejected but or we're always accepting of these things but it's a ma- it's a simple matter of humility and it's also a matter of if you want friends you can't last in friendship if you're always burdening people so if there's no way for me to say i have to have any private time i can't do this i have to have some private time so you're allowed to not answer people simply not answer or to tell them to go back uh, it's not the time today it's on the phone nobody should imagine that a person has to be uh, uh answer that just because someone doesn't answer your text that they hate you this is a big like west west that a lot of people get oh they now obviously if it's months and months and months then it's going to be different but in general you had to give people an excuse maybe they're they're busy maybe they're sick maybe they just can't do it i remember be, uh, pe- uh, wondering why people cannot simply answer a message right And then you realize when you get busy in life that you see the message, you then see hundreds of other messages over the week and you totally forget the first message. So you end up doing exactly what you wondered, you know, why people are doing it to you. So so he always said le bake and that's uh, you get rewarded for it but you're not obligated, but the prophet always answered everybody who asked him for anything. So this is so that nobody think that's the obligation and therefore if you anyone ever calls you or talks to you you just have to answer everything. You don't. There comes a time especially in our in the digital age where you can may easily have over a dozen messages and a dozen missed calls a day. Right? You simply just you can't answer everything, right? And you simply just put your phone off. You have to or else you're going to go crazy. وأخرج ابن أبي حاتم عن السودي في قوله ولا تطع كل حلاف مهين. Don't uh, obey someone who is always swearing and is مهين, is lowly in his behavior. Let's see which what Al Baghawi says about this. ولا تطع كل حلاف مهين. Okay, and that it is going to be about Abu Jahl. Anyone here know what a zanim is? Child of zina. Zanim. This was a revelation for Abu Jahl. He never knew he was a child of zina. He went back to his mother and he asked her, Am I a child of zina? He, she said, Yes. That's a proof for you that this book is from Allah. He refused, still refused. That's how blind a person is. وَلَا تُطْعَ كُلَّ حَلَّافٍ مَّهِينٍ كَثِيرُ الْحَلِفْ بِالْبَاطِلِ He's always swearing and it's a lie. That's halaf. He's always swearing. Wallahi. And it's a lie. قَالَ مُقَاتِلْ يَعْنِي الْوَلِيدِ بْنِ الْمُغِيرَةِ وَقِيلَ الْأَسْوَدِ بْنَ عَبْدِ يَغُوثِ وَقَالَ عَطَاءَ الْأَخْنَسِ بْنِ شَرِيقِ شُرَيْقِ And maheen is weak. And not respectable. Da'ifun haqir. Okay. Hamaz. He's always backbiting. 
always backbiting. That this is one thing now that I would have trouble getting close to people who aren't practicing Muslims. They backbite. Nothing stops them from backbiting, right? If they backbite to you, they'll backbite against you. Hamaz. Masha bin Amim. He is always talking about other people and causing conflict between other people. Manna'in lil khair. He stops the good. He doesn't like the good. Meaning Islam being the first one of them. Okay. And everything else that Islam brings. Mu'tadin. He's always aggressing on others before they aggress on him. In the material mindset, you probably would aggress on people before they aggress on you. Because you know eventually it's a dog-eat-dog world. From a material standpoint, and there's no creator, you take that mentality. Utul, extremely harsh. Ghalil, Jafi. There's no warmth in this personality. Utulin. Okay. And that results because of fahsha. When you do a lot of fawahish, filthy sins, you become harsh and you become distant. And there's no warmth in your personality anymore. Okay. And it's constant argumentation and issues with people. Okay. بعد ذلك, on top of all that, Zanim. Okay. وهو الدعي الملصق بالقوم وليس منهم he's not one of them he's a child of zina he's not one of the tribe يريد مع هذا هو دعي فهو في قريش وليس منهم he claims to be from Quraysh he's not even one of them قال مرة الهمداني إنما ادعاه أبو أبوه بعد ثماني عشر سنة وقيل الزنيم الذي له زنم كزنمة الشاه وقال سعيد بن جبير عن ابن عباس كان يعرف بالشرك كما تعرف الشاب زنمتها لا نعلم أن الله وصف أحدا إلا ذكر من عيوبه ما ذكر من عيوب الوليد بن المغيرة so some say this is وليد المغيرة فألحق به عارا لا يفارقه في الدنيا والآخرة وليد ابن المغيرة خالد بن وليد زداد where is it that it says about um, Abu Jahl? An Sufyan, Haddathani Ma'bad, Ibn Khalid al Qaisi, An Haritha, Ibn Wahb al Khuzai, Kala Kala Rasallahu Ali Wasallam, Ala Ukhbirukum bi Ahl al Jannah, Kulu Daif and Mutadaif, Lo Aksam Ala Allahi La Abarra. Every uh, humble person, he would never have any desire to ex- ag- ag- aggress on somebody else. If he speaks to, if he asks anything of Allah, Allah gives it to him. أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِأَهْلِ النَّارِ كُلُّ عُتُلٍ جَوَّاضٍ مُتَكَبِّرٍ Every aggressive, all right, harsh and arrogant person. Okay, so this is Al-Walid al-Mughira talking about all of this, talking about Al-Walid al-Mughira. And كَانَ ذَا مَالُ وَبَنِينَ Next. وأخرج ابن أبي حاتم عن ابن جريج أن أبا جهل قال يوم بدر خذوهم أخذا فاربطوهم في الجبال ولا تقتلوا منهم أحدا فنزلت إنا بلوناهم كما بلونا أصحاب الجنة يقول في قدرتهم عليهم كما اقتدر أصحاب الجنة على الجنة So Abu Jahl was saying on the day of Badr um, Take these, take these, we're going to take them, and we're going to tie them to the mountain so that they could die a slow death. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abu Jahl is nothing. He has no power. He's just like the people of the garden. And the people of the garden were those people who, um, the, the garden of Surah Al-Qalam was about a family that the father was very charitable, but the kids were not. And the kids, after the father died, they said, Send the poor away. We're not giving this to charity anymore. We're keeping all the money to ourselves. Oh, shortly thereafter, a storm came and destroyed it all. So just showing them that they have no power. 
So that is our coverage of Surat Al-Qalam. And we went from Ma'arij today to Al-Qalam. And now let's turn to everybody's um, comments and questions. Where are we starting? Where are we starting today? Hmm. What you got, Ryan? Abu Qais? What is that? I don't know. If Majnoon doesn't produce poetry, can it not be said what Abu Qais, who was called Majnoon, or is what is meant is clinically insane, whereas Majnoon Qais was just in deep love? Oh, no, that's allegorical Majnoon. Majnoon and Layla. I think he's talking about that famous poem, Majnoon and Layla. It's just, he was just in love with her, but... That was just a poem, though. Yeah. Yes. What's a good number just to plug to do for poetry schools? Minimum 300 a day. Yeah. Yeah. Samini Yassin. It's not, it's, uh, it is not necessary to answer the door. It's not necessary to answer an email. It's not fodded upon you, but it's good character if you do. Okay. So you could say sunnah, yes. You can say sunnah. You can say it is rewardable if you answer people, but you are under no obligation to answer anybody. That's actually, yeah, I mean, of course your parents probably is the only obligation. You're obligated to answer your parents. You're obligated to answer your wife. You're obligated to answer your husband. And you're obligated to answer your daughter if she needs help. And your son if he needs help until he can pay his own way. Bin Suleiman says, given the conditions of Tawbah, what is the Maliki position on what Tawbah looks like? Tawbah is in the heart. 100% in the heart. And then it it is all about avoiding the repetition of that sin, whatever that sin is. But toba is in the heart with the regret. On the tongue, with admission that we've done the wrong. With the tongue as well, in making istighfar. You have to ask Allah for forgiveness. Many people, they'll admit that they were wrong, but they won't ask Allah for forgiveness. They won't ask the person that they abused for forgiveness. So that's the second thing you have to do with your tongue. On the whole body is to not repeat that sin again. That's the fard on the whole body. Can women wear trainers during Umrah? Women can w- do not have ihram. They have, in terms of clothing, they have the intent, they have ihram. Let me rephrase that. The ihram of women does not affect their clothing. They can wear anything that is halal to wear. The ihram of women when they make umrah and hajj has other things such as the intention and that they do not do certain things such as clip nail, clip hair, but they do not have any clothing requirements or prohibitions. In fact, what they do have is a prohibition. No clothes can touch their face or their hands. So even a woman in niqab, they wear a cap and the cloth goes out like this. It cannot touch their face. If there are seven heavens and you're on the bottom one, does that mean you don't see the people who are higher up? So you never see the Prophet ﷺ? Yes, that's what it means. You'll see them like you'll see planets and stars, but they can come down and visit you. They can come down, but you can't go up. We would get burned. Sophia says, I keep telling people all the time, our phone isn't a part of my arm. And if I don't want to look at it, don't be mad. That's so true. Right? So someone tells me, there's someone who tells me all the time, an elder, he says, you don't answer, that's arrogance. I said, it's not arrogance. There's no arrogance here. I don't have to hold, if I'm talking to you now, right? Face to face, and I text you, isn't that, and I'm texting somebody else, isn't that rude? Yes. So therefore, how, why don't you assume I'm talking with other people? That's why I don't text you back. I don't call you back. Or I don't, I don't pick up the call, because I'm with other people. That's rude. Okay.
If a sister unconsciously adjusts her clothes and sometimes her hijab is slipping, so she adjusts, would this invalidate salah? No. If it's accidental like that. With regards to f rights over family, if one family member is treated as a scapegoat in terms of psychological term, of the psychological term, would it be okay to cordial, to be cordial but not mingle? Yes, it's okay. It's okay to avoid harm. You don't intend to, to, to cut off your family, but you may intend to avoid harm. That is permitted for you. Minnie says, I think people have no patience because we can just easily respond ASAP. Yeah, you, it's, you, you imagine that someone could easily respond. That's the imagination that we have. We imagine that the person's sitting there and ignoring us. But why don't you use your imagination for probably what's more accurate, which is that they're just not next to their phone, right? Um, or they're in a meeting or all that other stuff, okay? And what about the... Uh, now, if it's months on end, then that's different. Then you know they don't want to talk to you anymore. But we take another approach. Well, why are you so obsessed with other people? Why don't you find sufficiency with yourself? Take a hike. Go take a walk. Fly a kite. What was her name? Amelia Bedelia? Mini Star says, also, how social media keeps going on about if someone doesn't respond within X time, they don't want to know you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Abed Niaz, does discussing someone's behavior when they're not around count as backbiting? If there's a reason, then it is not backbiting. So, for example, if teachers get together and they talk about the behavior of a student, if employers get together, managers get together, and they discuss the performance of an employee, but it has to be restricted to that which has a purpose. So if they start going into that which has nothing to do with his job, such as his appearance or his personal life, that would be considered as backbiting. Okay. Shahiyah is coming at 2.30, inshallah. So... We're, we're on segment number two. We'll take your questions, and then we'll move to segment number three. And if you enjoy this podcast, you go to patreon.com forward slash Safina Society as we now start to bring guests on, inshallah, more often. Okay. Can you speak on the Humari brothers? Not really. I don't really, I don't really research into them. Of course, they are Moroccan they're a family of knowledge that f specializes in hadith. They are not Madikiya, they are not Asha'ira, and they have a tariqah. I don't know what the tariqah is. Is it, what what branch is it? Qadiriya maybe? I don't know, but they are not Madikiya. They go against the Madiki method in many ways. but and, and they are many. And they are scholars of hadith. They are, they spent a lot of their efforts responding to the Wahhabis. Okay. So they are their own thing, in my opinion, from what I've seen, that they're not, a f like, uh, they not, haven't even declared that they're Madiki. Just because someone's Moroccan doesn't mean he's a Madiki. Moroccan and an against the Wahhabis does not mean he's a Madiki. And they also, they went against the Ashadis in many ways, right? So they're not limited to that. I don't know, I don't know if they went that far, but they're on their own. In terms of those things. That's what I know about them. That's what I've been told about them. Aisha Davies gives you the golden rule. If they talk about you, they will talk. If they talk to you about others, they will talk about you. Okay? Whoever does namima to you, guarantee will do namima about you. You're not special. Okay? You one day will be on the menu. Because namima, it's a shahwa, it's a desire. I'm telling you, get a community together. The first thing is get ghiba out of the community. That is the first step to success. The second thing to do, if you ever want to jumpstart a group of friends, a community, get backbiting out of the system. Number two, learn tajweed. Tajweed, 
there's something special about Tajweed circles. It requires a lot of humility. It requires coming to the masjid. It requires physically being there. Everything good comes out of the Tajweed circles. Anytime that I felt like the community needs a quick jump start, start a Tajweed class, right? And all, especially in the summertime when the days are long, right? Like a little bit after end of Asr, 7 o'clock, let's say, all the way till Maghrib, 8, 8, 15, 8, 30. And everyone's reciting Quran, people are making mistakes, it's very humbling, and you're in the masjid doing, doing this for about an hour. And you do this like two, three times a week, by the end of the summer, you have a wonderful community. You have a wonderful group of people. Does going to Umrah with a group satisfy the mahram requirement? Yes. Yes, it does. Revert says, as a revert, should I mention to a potential spouse that I'm uncircumcised? No, you do not have to mention that. What you must mention to your spouse is that which will affect the intimacy and your ability to maintain her. Because what, what she's getting for the deal is protection and intimacy. What you're getting from the deal is intimacy. Okay? Or it's talking about the objective physical measurables. Nobody should say, oh, well, what about friendship and all this companionship? Yes, that's all fine and good. But we're talking about objective measurables. The objective measurable that is the reason that marriage exists, okay, is intimacy protection and procreation insofar as any of these are threatened and you cannot perform them you must tell them so if somebody has a problem with their private parts then you don't have to dis describe the, pri the problem uh, unless it helps understand you simply must say I have a trouble doing trouble doing this because I have such and such a disease right if describing the disease is necessary. If your credit is bad, you have to tell her, I was, I had a lot of credit cards, I'm out. I can never rent a house, I never rent a car, right? Um, my credit is that bad. She, it's her right to know that. She's going to be taking care of you then, right? That's not the deal, okay? If she comes and she says, I have no interest in men, she has to say that if that's her problem then don't get married. Okay, You can't go and experiment on the guy. And same thing happens with men. They may say, for example, a um, situation may come about, he's not interested in women. Hey, Ahmed, can you kindly plug this in? And where's our, our mega charger, our long one? Hey, can you nab, me, nab that extension cord right there? So, that, so that's what you have to mention when you're going to marry. You don't have to mention, I used to have this sin. I used to have that sin. I have this, that, and the other. None of that's important. All right, not, no, it's not important. It's not necessary for you to describe. I mean, in other words, if you, get, if you marry somebody, let's say uh, if a girl marries somebody. Thank you. If a girl mar Wait, is it on? Let's just double check. Yes, it is. Good, thank you. If a girl marries somebody who is an Indian convert, okay, to Islam, and she thinks she's marrying an Indian Muslim, he never mentioned that he's a convert. He doesn't have to. Did you ask? He didn't have to, right? So a lot of things that in marriage that uh, you might want to know, but it's not necessarily an obligation to mention it. Okay. Circumcision also, don't go and get circumcised in a hospital. It's not a valid reason to, to, learn, to, to show your aura. You want to go and get a kit online, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, have, and do it yourself, or have your wife do it for you, okay? Do they sell the kit on Amazon? <laughs> Ahmed, can you look it up, please? I thought you were going to Walmart. Walmart. <laughs> yeah. 15 more minutes until Sheikh Yahya arrives. Bin Suleiman says, might be TMI. What's TMI? Too much information. But a brother is concerned about air coming out of his rear end, but not from the gut, but from when he bends over. If it is not gas, it does not break wudu. If it is someone who wind or air passes through between his legs, that is not, does not break wudu. Open it again, please, the, the Amazon page. 
Okay. Open it again. Fast and free delivery. What's the kit called? Just for the sake of people out there who never got circumcised, maybe they want to. This is, I remember we discussed this before, but and people got upset that we laughed. But um, here now, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make sure not to laugh. Complete suture practice kit. Practice <laughs> on who? <laughs> practice, practice kit. Let me read that. Practice kit for suture training. Okay, no, we don't want practice. We, this is not a thing you can make a mistake on. All right, keep going. Where is the circumcision kit? Okay, we haven't found one just in case. Yeah, and it's a sunnah if you want to do that. Okay. Daydream of autumn. She's like, I just joined. What's going on? <laughs> okay, tell me when you find something. Uh, where is the next group trip? Um, the next Umrah for youth is next December, inshallah. And it is for youth. We're only taking one bus. So it probably won't be advertised except to some certain people who are from the high school age. But we do want to have, um, we do, we do want to have, a, whatchamacallit, um, some other group trips too. Like we might go to Texas this, this summer. That's on the, that's on the table. Anything, Ahmed? No, there's there's no why don't you check the Orthodox Jews? They should have that. Okay. Yeah, they have to suck the blood themselves. Which is bizarre. Yeah, they have to suck the blood themselves. Can you talk about the ayah says strangest? That says Istighfar brings rain provision. I heard people say that meaning is literal. It is literal and allegoric. We just talked about that, believe it or not. I don't know if you just came on, but if you go to the beginning of the stream, you'll talk about it. Uh, you'll hear us talking about it. Aisha Davies says, I always tell my kids they're not ob obligated to answer the door unless it's me or the authorities. Yeah, kids, when they're young, they're, they don't know, understand. They run, right? And then when they become of hijab age, someone rings the doorbell. It's like an FBI raid, right? <laughs> Running hijab, right? See, so you... you <laughs> You might not know that. Do you have a sister, right? You, Ryan doesn't know this, but uh, when you have a house with two, three hijabis in the house and someone rings the doorbell, it's like the FBI, it's an FBI raid on the house. People running, scurrying, rolling over, hiding behind couches and tables, right? Uh, and the, the way that Muslims used to have their house was better. They had a middle area that you could let everybody in as soon as they ring the doorbell, but they still don't see the house. Okay? And so that, that gives time, that allows you to bring them in, yet it gives time for the women to go and get ready. Waterman, you talked about Ibn Arabi not marrying. Yeah, he did get married. He didn't want to get married at the time, he didn't like the idea. When he heard the Prophet's hadith about marriage, he said, Oh Allah, change my heart and make me love the sunnah. And he did and he got married. Samina says, Is there any obligation to tell the person you believed wronged you that they did so? How can someone ask for forgiveness from a person or Allah for an unknown offense? Therefore, they're innocent really, in a sense. They can't be held accountable if they don't know that they upset you. Because sometimes people's upsetting you is, it's not something that they know they did. And there was a brother, believe it or not, he didn't, he felt that I had sort of brushed him off. Right? Until a third person came in and he said, by the way, I want to, uh, we're going to go hang out with so-and-so, but keep in mind he's a bit sensitive because he feels that you brushed him off. I was like, I never brushed him off. He's like, well, apparently, and it could happen. Like, you could be saying salam to somebody, and someone's got their arm out, and you just, you're like, your, your arm just goes salam to the other person without looking at him, without realizing that you just did this rude thing. So, I guess they have to know. And if it's something that is subjective, though, then maybe we're being oversensitive, too. So, it has to be a wrong, right? Something offensive can go both ways. It could be like, oh, I didn't really mean that. 
So you could bring it up if you want. If Salah stops you from getting burnt by the hellfire, does that mean you can still get punished in other ways? Yes, you can get your sins removed in different ways. Sicknesses, flus, pneumonia, loss of money, getting tickets. Okay, uh, You can have a kid who's rude to you, a child who's not polite. Daydream of autumn. If a, she- if a husband and a wife divorce, is he still a mahram for the period of the idda? No, she should cover in front of him. She, no, they don't. Uh, but if she should cover in front of him, she should separate from him. But if he does anything that would indicate that, he, that intimacy, it negates the divorce right away. And it's not zina. It's not zina. Can he communicate? They should communicate with a third person. Yes. Live on the Nile. Can we reconcile between the hadith that says no two people love one another for the sake of Allah or for Islam then separated from one another but that it was due to a sin one of them committed? What is the meaning of that? Um, and the, she's saying that the ayah of Harut and Marut separating husband and wife. Harut and Marut does not have anything to do with that hadith. Harut and Marut has to do purely with black magic. Okay. And it is true that if two people are on the same heart, they're friends, that means their hearts are very similar. Then they split up. It is likely to be due if they have a breakup. It's likely because one of their hearts went down and or the other went up. Okay. And if your heart goes up, you should take people with you. But if your dean goes down and you start committing sins then at that point it must be, that's the reason for the breakup, probably. Yes. Am I able to see a potential spouse's hair before marriage? No, you cannot. You're not allowed to. I have a marriage proposal from a second generation convert, just like you suggested. Alhamdulillah, very good. Everything is falling in place. I've been praying istikhara. Please pray for me. So, uh, Sister Mu'mina, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make your path easy. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayhi min khayrin faqeer. You should repeat this dua. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayhi min khayrin faqeer. All right, so a very good dua, a strong, powerful dua. Okay. Very strong uh, dua. Okay. Does one have to apologize if people attack another person and th- because they have an issue within themselves? Yes. Anytime that you harm another person, you have to... Um, you do have to make it up for them. Even if it's not an apology, you have to make it up with something better. All right, let's see. Tasneem saying, the Ghumaris, the father of the Ghumaris, they were Shafi'iyya, and some people say he was one of the Awliya and the Abdal. That is very possible. I just said that they separated from the Maliki Madhab and the Ash'ari Aqidah. Doesn't mean they went into Bid'ah. It just means that they're not limiting themselves to that, or they're not adhering to that. They have their own beliefs. That's what I have been told about them. I could be wrong, but uh, I've seen the I've seen documents like their books where they went off. So Malik was wrong on this, and they went against the Ashari position in many things. Qaisyun says, "What's your response to those on the Salafi spectrum who say tawassul is shirk? We are all doing tawassul at all times. Tawassul means taking a means." in order to make Allah pleased with you. We are all doing that at all times. Okay. Uh, hey, Rai, which email did you... You sent it to Sharia's email? Okay. We sent to your Gmail. How to stop oneself from getting into discussions with shopkeepers and dentists about what you were told not or told or not told or what has or hasn't happened. Um, 
you can, and, and I regret it. So talking too much. Uh, decrease the eye contact if you don't want to talk too much. Make It should be easy, right? Am I allowed to ask a potential spouse to show me a picture without hijab before marriage? No. A picture, yes, but not without hijab. And Mu'minah gives the correct answer to that. So does Al-Yamama. They give the correct answer. Yaseen Archuleta is here and says, Salaam alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Can we tell people the virtues of Sayyidina Muawiyah? Yes, you may. He's a Sahabi. Jaleel. He, he's a Sahabi. He's not from the veterans, but he was a younger Sahabi. And he was given the, by the Prophet the job of being his scribe and the scribe of, the, uh, of his letters. So... Okay. Is getting a beard implant permitted? Um, Allah Alam, but I have seen a fatwa that it is permitted, yes. I have I have seen the fatwa is permitted, yes. I'm not on Arc View, I'm just looking for an audio recording of it. Of what? Oh, this must be part of a discussion, a conversation they're having. I always get caught up in, in reading a question and it turns out it's a conversation he's having someone else. And Abbas says, fake question, if I am doing ghusl and I do something to break my wudu, do I have to redo the ghusl? Only the limbs of wudu. Okay? Only the li- limbs of wudu. Khadija Asif, Quran teachers give you the biggest ego check. Yes, that's why tajweed is, is part of, it's like spiritual almost. It's an ego check. Um Maryam, in Hanafi fiqh, women can't wear artificial rings, if not gold or silver. Is she allowed to wear a thicker ring? Why are they not allowed to wear artificial rings? What is artificial in the first place? Right? I never heard that. Can, can Ahmed, can you ask uh, someone at Hanafi about that? Okay. Yeah, Hanafi fiqh. There's, there, there, there can't be a rule that says you can only wear gold and silver. It's impossible. Yeah. Take our ArcView classes because ArcView has started up, folks. The live classes, the, 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 the uh, pre-recorded classes are all there. And we're still waiting on a couple more lectures on Hanbali Aqidah. But the pre-recorded classes are all there. And today, live classes today, Hanafi Fiqh. Hanafi is got Monday. Then Maliki Fiqh Tuesday. Shafi Fiqh Wednesday. Hanbali Fiqh Thursday. Aqidah is Sunday before all that. Sheikh Murad started his class yesterday, right? And all the kids' classes are Sunday too. And then Tasawuf is Thursday. Sheikh Imran Ahmed tonight on Hanafi Fiqh. And you can ask all your Fiqh questions. So sign up to ArcView Basic. Madiha, I wanted to ask about something you mentioned about child's custody. Going to the father after 12. After Bulugh. When he reaches Bulugh, he goes to his dad. Is this required? Even when there is DV? What's DV? What is DV exactly? Yeah. Um, it is required. It, it All of these rules are flexible, but that is the sunnah. That the child should go, uh, the boy, not the girl, the boy, upon puberty goes to his dad. But I don't know what DV is. Oh, domestic violence. No, if he's violent and there is some proof that he will hurt the kid, then no. But there has to be proof, right? Okay. When is that? What? what? We're in oh, so Fiqh al Akbar is over and we're now on the Nasafiyya. Okay.
Oh, by the way, Arcview, Wednesdays, we have a U UK timed class. Sharh of Sahih Muslim. I'm going to read that, and that's going to be an it's Arcview scholarship, Arcview Plus class. It's dedicated for the UK timing in terms of timing. It's going to be right after the stream by a half hour. Hmm? What's that? Yeah. Muzammil Khan. Recite, reciting Salat and Jina 100 times the last third of the night relieves us of many, many, many things. Yes, for anything. Aisha Davies, okay, since we are discussing marriage, what advice do you give to a sister who has been single for a while because she was hurt in past marriages and is off, put off from marriage? I would say the answer to that is husna dhanni billah. Good opinion of Allah. And try to rationalize it statistically, right? I was hurt by one guy. One guy doesn't represent all guys. I was hurt by one man. Try to just like rationalize it. If you were hurt, if you married 10 times and you failed 10 times, right? Well, that's too much, but two times, let's say. And the, both times the guy was bad. Then at that point, it's one of two things. Either my selection process was no good. Or, because he is bad, my selection process was no good. Or, still, nonetheless, two guys do not represent all guys, Right? So you try to rationalize things with yourself like that and then ultimately ask Allah to open your heart for trust. That's the fastest route. Oh Allah, let my heart trust somebody again. That's the way. You ask Allah to let your heart trust somebody again. Right? And that's the fastest route. Is Allah, Our hearts are in, uh, in Allah's hands. Okay. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to, to change them for us. Some people trust too easily. Some people trust too hard. Or they're too hard to trust. So they, they don't trust people. And there's reasons for that. Okay. I'm just getting word here that wearing artificial jewelry is permitted in Hanafi fiqh. I'm even surprised that artificial is not even a category. Right? That, how is that a legal category? Artificial, non-gold or silver. So she's saying here it's permitted. Okay. Is riba allowed in any condition? No, it's not allowed in any condition. There's only one, is that the only way for you to live in a house is by riba. Then yes, that's permitted. Okay. Welcome Maya Jones. Ahlan wa sahlan Maya Jones. In the Shafi'i school, female circumcision is obligatory, says so in reliance of the traveler. I do not know about that. I've uh, I've never heard that if male circumcision is not obligatory, female will definitely not be obligatory. I've never heard that, and Allah is best. Kaisun says, "What is your response to the Salafi spectrum who say tawassul awliya is shirk?" We answered that already. We said no. Tawassul means to love. Tawassul is the love is or sorry sorry tawassul bil awliya is presenting your your love for this person as a deed. It is a type of amal, tawassul, seeking a means through actions. And we are meant to seek a means for actions. You want, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, if you want something from your creator, do something. Fast. Do an action. So when you love one of the awliya Allah, okay, that's an action of the heart. So, uh, yes, I know a lot of mothers, this is about the custody, find it difficult, the idea that handing your child back to the dad. Is it circumstantial? It is circumstantial. And uh, there are circumstances that would cause a person not to do that. Right? Our medic is allowed to combine the prayer. Yes, we are allowed to combine when traveling, when moving, when moving to the... Uh, destination once you arrive at the destination then the majority opinion is that we cannot combine I would love to be Shafi in, in travelers prayers okay alright Sheikh Yahya is now with us assalamu alaikum rahmatullah can you raise the volume on the TV You got the remote, Ahmed?
Marhaman, kif haluk? Alhamdulillah, how are you? MashaAllah. How, how, is, how is everything? Did you have classes today? Uh, so the class is every session, yes. MashaAllah. And, and what does your schedule look like? So I just got back from Tampa. We were in Tampa over the weekend. Oh, Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah, for the school? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Is it far? Not far, not far. All like uh, continuous now? Contiguous? Uh, not in the exact same area, but yeah, I mean, not in the exact same area. Here, alhamdulillah, mashallah. So as, as we uh, bring you on to the main screen here, let me do some introduction and tell everybody that Sheikh Yahya wrote us is only an hour from us in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he has a madrasa that started literally with like two people. It started back in the day with David Kearns and, um, was it Sir Fraz? What was his name? Paracha. Suleiman Paracha. Paracha. Right? Suleiman Paracha and David Kearns. And um, Sheikh Yahya started this project maybe 10 years ago. SubhanAllah, 10 years ago. And it has grown, mashallah, grown and grown and grown. And if you, any of you want to ever go, you can go for a weekend. There are four, four or six sessions a year. Camps. A weekend retreat and then one family summer retreat. Good. There's five, five weekend retreats and one family summer retreat. So you can go out there and you can spend a weekend in Allentown, Pennsylvania and study under Sheikh Yahya and see Muqasid and read the, recite the awrad and do all these things for a weekend. You roll in, what, Friday, and then um, you'll leave Sunday night, and it's a great way to spend your weekend. All the people who spend weekends doing, you know, other things, you should include this into your weekend. And you can get all this information at almaqasid.org. Almaqasid being spelled A-L-M-A-Q-A-S-I-D dot O-R-G. And you can get onto their email list, and you could fly out there, Take a flight, you and your wife, or you by yourself. Take a flight out there and um, take one of these weekend retreats. If you are watching on Instagram, hop over to YouTube so you can see Sheikh Yahya's face. Otherwise, you're just going to see the split between us uh, because Instagram only gives the long angle like that. So uh, hop over to Sufi the Safina Society YouTube channel to begin uh, uh, and to and to begin this interview and to watch Sheikh Yahya and learn something from him. The first thing I want to ask Sheikh Yahya is, I want you to tell us the latest at Maqasid. What's the latest that you want people to know? Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa man wa ala. First of all, thank you, Habib, for inviting us. You're beloved to the soul. And may Allah Ta'ala keep us together. And all the people around you in MBIC and the New Brunswick area and that all the people following you online are very blessed to Amen. that have you and to benefit from you and may Allah Ta'ala keep us together and bless us with those who work together and assist one another in thought and obedience Amen. of Allah Ta'ala. Amen. Uh, the latest at Ad Maqasid, so mashallah tabarakallah, um, you know, it, it's uh, in this whole process of trying to serve the Ummah of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the most impactful things that our teacher, Sayyid Habib Umar, had said is that the very least that all of us should meet Allah with is making the intention, making the intention to establish this deen throughout the earth. And then to disseminate the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst all people. And when you think about the grand nature of that statement, and of course, this is by way of intention, and obviously that oftentimes, as you very well know, our circle of influence is very different than our circle of concern. But this is the concern that our teachers want us to have, a universal concern for all of humanity, Muslim and non-Muslim like, and then even beyond that for the animal kingdom and then taking care of nature and the natural resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And so on one hand is that you don't 
like to get into scope creep and you start with something very small and very focused and the heart of hearts of what we're doing relates to the full-time seminary believing first and foremost that this is the single most important thing that we need moving forward as muslims in any place in the world at any time but especially in our context the united states of america a program that can that root the prophetic inheritance in the hearts of individuals, and then they can carry on the tradition. All of these statistics that we talk about in the 50, 75 million Muslims that might be in this country in the 30, 40 years, none of that means anything if we do not be, transfer this religious heritage to the upcoming generation. So the heart of what we're doing is that full-time program. And of course, you have to begin very small, and that requires an enormous amount of work. And it's not low-hanging fruit. It's not fruit that harvests in the first two years or even the three years. Um, I'm hoping that in the next 50 years, we can at least have planted the seeds. And I really mean that. Um, because you're ultimately dealing with very big issues. What does it mean to hang on to tradition in the modern world? That what does it mean to that establish a seminary in light of a world of secular materialism and the very quick accelerating rate of change and all of these other very big topics. If we're going to really do what we need to do, we need to get this right and to build very solid, solid foundations that are not going to blow away with the wind mm -hmm. as the changing circumstances continue to strike us. So that that's the heart of what we're doing. And then the latest right now that I've really been thinking about is I've started to realize in addition to the in-person community, which are those that are studying full-time with us and those who have moved to the area to benefit from some of the other services, is in the increasing imperative of taking uh, care of an online international community. And the more you travel, the more that you find that little initiatives that our people are doing, I'm sure that you experience the same thing with your podcast, that with that uh, <clears throat> things like you're doing through ArcView, that it literally is the lifeline for some people. And that, you know, obviously the foundation is in-person uh, instruction and sitting at the feet of scholars. But this is a band-aid that is an important thing that you and I do. And our teachers don't speak of it as this is something we should do. It's yejib. We must. It is a religious obligation to use all modern means of communication to help people throughout the world. And one of the greatest proofs is me. I remember one of our friends saying that he had a, a student one time in an online class in Tel Aviv, Israel, Ajib. that had already become Muslim and had to be in his classes. That in, when his parents couldn't have found out or else they, who knows what they would have done to him. So you, you start to realize, and that honestly, Habib has really created a lot of, you know, a, a, a heavy feeling of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, that you try to just take enough rest to get by just in order to give yourself fully to the community. But the more we realize this, the degree of responsibility, it really is an international one. And even in places of Soprano, like Egypt, in places like Saudi Arabia, they're increasingly looking to people that speak the language of our time, not just English, but the frame in which the, the dean is presented uh, from people that have been trained in the, in the West is that increasingly that there's a responsibility on upon our shoulders. So that's really the latest in my mind is trying to put that together, how to really create an online community mm -hmm. and to have, to the extent possible, replicate the experience of the in-person, that local community online and to channel people from that once they get interested and want something from A and then move along to B, C, D, E, F and down the line where they can have uh, more sustained opportunities to deepen their faith and to draw near to Allah. So that's a long-winded answer, but... No, that's, that's a, it's a great answer. And now that you brought up the <laughs> online, I wanted to ask that uh, it's easy to comprehend the concept of taking a class online and talking to the teacher. You can get the answers that you're looking for uh, through the online communication, through WhatsApp or what have you. But the, the, the spiritual feeling or the environment of ibadah and dhikr is really hard to replicate online. So what would you, what is your advice to somebody who is, whose lifeline is through the web, is an online community? What re, re, uh, routine should they have 
in terms yeah. of ibadah and dhikr so that they could have that nourishment as well. Sure. May Allah bless you. Um, I would say that the, the first thing is you make your home, your apartment, the room in which you live, wherever it is that you live, a sacred space. Make sure you have a special designated place, place for prayer. And if you have a home, dedicate a room if you can. That if you don't have a home, designate a space within an existing room where you go to pray, where you go to be in a state of solitude, where you go and you can face the Qibla and you can remember your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to replicate what people are doing in prayer spaces and in sacred spaces like Zawaya and so forth somewhere in your home. I guess that would be a, a starting point. And make sure that you have regular litanies, whatever they are. If you have a particular weird litany that you recite, make sure that you recite that in the morning, in the evening. And in addition to something like the prophetic invocations that the prophet left behind, something like a weird little teeth, uh, which takes roughly 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening, try to also have time that you spend with the book of Allah Ta'ala at least 10 minutes, give it to the book of Allah Ta'ala, however much you can read, and sending salawat upon our Prophet Sallallahu and then istighfar at certain times during the day, and a lot more could be said there, but I guess that to me would be a starting point. And then secondly, try to be a, around the very best people possible in your locale. Companionship is key. And if there's no one to be around, take the companionship of the awliya, and this could be a second point or even a third point, by reading their biographies. We need to connect the community to the biographies of the great awliya and saints and ulama who came before us. And now we could give you a list of 10 to 12, 13 books that could be read. And that would take you several years to probably get through unless you were an avid reader. I would say these are three that very strong points. And then use your free time well. Instead of going to Aruba or Cozumel or wherever, that spend your free time, that going to visit people, revive this concept of rihla, which was traditionally done for sacred knowledge, for learning, but also for suhbah, for companionship, being around people. We learned the story of Sayyidina Sahal ibn Al-Tustari that traveled all the way to Basra from where he was from to ask a question. And the question was, can the heart prostrate? And he was 13 years old. He traveled all the way from where he was, from Tustar, all the way to Basra, to ask a particular scholar that might be able to give him the answer. And the only other thing I'll say there is there's a lot of opportunities now to connect to gatherings uh, online. Uh, and one of the benefits of being in the gatherings of the righteous is that they can, if you will, spiritualize technology. Mm -hmm. So the teacher of our teachers, Habib Abdul Qadir Rahman Saqaf, used to say in the day of cassette tapes, he said, the one who listens to a recording of my gathering as, as if they're in the gathering. SubhanAllah. Our teacher, Sayyidi Hab Omar, says the same thing regularly, is that the one who follows online is as if they are in that gathering. In other words, normally there's a degree, there's a separation of reality through the medium of TV, through the medium of online, whatever. There's a degree of separation. But for the awliya, when they say that, Allah has given them the ability to spiritualize technology. You will get the same portion and this is the important thing, is that you feeling it is not a prerequisite mm. for you to receive it. You might not feel it, but you will get the same portion. Those are just a few things. I'm sure some other good things you would be able to add as well, Habib. Now, you, you mentioned biographies, and you mentioned uh, Habib Abdul Qadir al saqqaf And that leads me to my third question, which is share with our audience something that sticks <laughs> out in your mind something unique that sticks out in your mind about Sheikh Abdul Qadr, Habib Abdul Qadr al saqqaf or somebody, somebody else, but he came to my mind recently since we were in Jeddah and met with his, uh, one of his top students, uh, Habib Muhammad al saqqaf So you, I'm sure you've met him a number of times and that probably was not speaking at that time, but you still may have, and he, he wasn't speaking to people at the time. Um, probably since two th 1998, I think. He wasn't really speaking much. But maybe you had some experiences there that you want to share. So when I, I'm, I can take this back to um, 
when I first met Dr. Mustafa al-Bedoui, uh, may Allah ta'ala preserve him, um, that very blessed soul who's done so much work and service for the Ummah of our Prophet وسلم, I met him at his home in Medina Munawwara. And he had a picture of Habib Ahmed Mashhur bin Taha al-Haddad on his wall, because that's his teacher, primary teacher. And I was with Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah in 1999. I actually had came from Sham. I was studying in Syria at that time uh, to perform, to visit the Prophet وسلم, to perform Ummah. And as we're sitting there, Dr. Omar looks at the picture of Habib Ahmed. And he says that when I was with Habib Ahmed, I imagine that were I to have been with the Prophet Sallallahu that's how it would have been. SubhanAllah. And for me, that really, it, th that to me really summarizes the experience of being with Habib Abdul Qadir, of being with Sayyid Habib Amar, of being, I didn't meet Habib Ahmed, that the stories you hear about Habib Ahmed, and so many of the other Habib, Habib Zain bin Sumayt, and a long list of others, is that there's something, along with the other great inheritors of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from Sadat, Hussainin, Wal Hassanin, and then from the other than Ahl al-Bayt. There's many great inheritors that you get glimpses of that reality. And I remember Habib Adi in the Mawlid in Wembley, when at a time when there wasn't too many Mawlids, where Fuad Nahdi, Rahimahullah, had put on a Mawlid in 2006 in Wembley. And Habib Adi spoke before Habib Umar. And I, I remember I was sitting very close to them, and Habib Umar looked at him, and he said in a lahja, Hadramiya, Tarayyad fil karam. In other words, take your time. Because he mm. felt that Adi might just speak quickly to show adab to his sheikh. Mm. He said, take your time, basically. So Habib Adi starts speaking, and he said that he was connected to Habib Abdul Qadir from the earliest time, but he didn't study the Shema until a little bit later. Yani later meaning in his late teens. And he said, when he started to read the description of the Shema'il, every description that he was reading, he had already seen it first in Habib Abdul Qadir. SubhanAllah. He knew the Shema'il through Habib Abdul Qadir before even reading it in the book. And this is the thing the true people of Allah, the grandson of uh, Habib Ahmed, Sayyid Omar bin Hamid al-Haddad, whom you met when he was here visiting. Mm -hmm. Every time that he speaks of a principle of the deen, yastashhad Yani immediately he mentions a story that's connected to something he's seen from his teacher. Subhanallah. Just a lot of people don't have that CD. Yeah. Like it's like read something in a book, but they don't have an experience that they've witnessed firsthand. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, then what about an in-person experience with one of mm. the old that's worth a million words? Subhanallah. And it's like I'm happy I'm what I used to say is that the tawalda of his primary sheikh before he went to the Bayla when he was very young, the son of Habib Adu bin Shihab, Habib Muhammad bin Adu bin Shihab. He said just watching him and seeing his humility was better than reading books for 20 years. SubhanAllah. Benefited more in that moment. And to me, a story that encapsulates the spirit, and I'll end on this, is that uh, Habib Adi narrates is that one time he went with Habib Abdul Qadir to a wedding. And as they were leaving the wedding, the host, as you should, walks that Habib Abdul Qadir, who's his honored guest, out. And Habib Abdul Qadir was older at that time. So to get into the car, he braced himself with his hand, pointing it that on the top of the car as he gets in. It's dark. The host doesn't see. There's a driver in front. Habib Adi's in the back. So they're not noticing either. But they, uh, the host closes the door. He doesn't realize that he's closed the door on Habib Abdul Qadir's hand. Subhanallah. Imagine the excruciating pain. Subhanallah. Habib Adi says he continues to talk to him a little bit, and Habib Abdul Qadir didn't even show that he was in pain. And then after they pulled away, that he asked the driver to pull over. And then he turns around to Habib Adi and he says, Adi, can you please open the door? So Habib Adi gets up the door, and his hand had been lodged in the door jam. Unbelievable. Wounded and so forth. He said, Habib, why didn't you say anything? And his response was, Is it were he to have known that he closed the door in my head, he would have felt so bad he never would have forgiven himself. SubhanAllah. Okay, Subhanallah. And the point is, like, Subhanallah. Yeah, what kind of mercy is in the heart of an individual like that? Yani, he's more concerned about that hurting the feelings of someone when he has every right to because. Yeah, subhanAllah. He's more concerned about 
hurting the feelings of a believer, then our, we're concerned is to commit kufar, to do something that is from the Kabayani. Subhanallah. That let alone the things that are, I mean, these are the true people of Islam. And when you're around them, your heart comes to life. And people that represent the teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu and I am a full conviction, if we can tap into that and just reflect the least degree of that in our societies, is that our people are going to enter into this deen inevitably. Like you cannot be exposed to the true sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and resist it unless you're a kafir. Mm. That you consciously deny it. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, how could you ever? Is, uh, when I was uh, meeting with the uh, students of Habib al Qadr this time around, one of them told me that he was not much of uh, classes and sessions as much as he was in the khidma of regular people, which was surprising to me. I did not, I did not expect to hear that. Mm -hmm. But he said that one of the things that Habib Abdul Qadir Saqaf was unique in was that he was always in the service yes. of seeking what, what are the needs of people. Because if people's needs aren't met, then they yeah. cannot sort of rise up to have the calmness of heart Yes, to, to do a bad. Even though he was a great scholar, he, he was a great scholar. He even read Shakespeare in translation, actually wrote a, picture, a poem about Shakespeare in Arabic. He was a great Shakespeare. scholar. Uh, and that in, in many ulum, they say he studied 500 books with his father, Habib Ahmed bin Abdurrahman, who's a student of Habib Ali Habshi. And he could have that taught at the highest level, but that was his way. And there's another story that they mentioned that one time he was gifted 1 million Saudi rials by a businessman, which is, what is that, like roughly $300,000 or something like yeah. that? So that after Asa, he gets in the car and he tells his driver, take me here. And he takes him and he passes some money to someone. He says, take me here, deliver this to someone. So take me here from Asr all the way until that into the night. And then after it, they said that he held the bag up side down. And he said, Allahumma fashad. Subhanallah. Bear witness. And he passed out every single real. And that there's so many meanings there. His obviously his, yeah, his detachment from the world, which is a given. But to your point, he knew the people. He knew who they were, and he went and traveled and drove around the streets of Jeddah. He knew who the people in need were, and if he wouldn't have been in their service and connected to them, then you think, when was the last time you and I actually gave someone zakat, like hand in hand? Subhanallah. Like you know, and alhamdulillah, I know that you all have that center now, uh, that you're, you know, where you're feeding people, and, and like we just have to, we have to be close to our people, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, our neighbors and. Uh, we need to revive that sunnah. But yeah, that is definitely one of the things that when you speak about Habib Abdul Qadr, he was very close to the people and in their service. And you hear these other amazing stories of going to people's homes and helping people with their problems and rectifying between people and people who that were trying to get residency and have a problem didn't, you know, would, weren't able to do so. And, you know, starting people up you know, in, in business. And you remember, mm. so Dr. Shadi and I, for all of you who don't know, I'm sorry, I'm going to expose you a little bit here. Sure. We, we both got married in 2002 and we both ended up somehow in Northern Virginia <laughs> at the tail end of Habib Adi Jeffrey's trip to the U.S. in 2002. And we ended up staying in the same house in the basement. It was it was the cousin of one of our friends, Hassan Sidki, an Egyptian brother. And he was getting ready to get married. I was getting ready to get married. And uh, that on one evening, we uh, were waiting to visit Habib Adi. We were waiting to go in and meet him. So I, did you go first or did I go first? I can't remember. I think you went first. So I think I went, went first. first. Yeah. And when I went you, in. You came out and you said you're up next. And then you went in. Yeah. So when I went in, that Habib, Habib Ali, that gave me a thousand dollars to get married. And he told me is that when I got married, this is what Habib Abdul Qadir did for me. Subhanallah. So this is what Habib Abdul Qadir did for me. And then you went in, same thing. <laughs> and it was like I gave you a thousand dollars. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And then we were just like, Subhanallah. Yeah, Lord. Subhanallah. These are people honorariums. They don't ask yeah. for honorariums. Subhanallah. Habib Ali in that trip, Habib. 
that we visited, it was like 25 days. I don't even know how many states we visited. He paid for everything. Hajib, everybody's accommodations, everybody's tickets. That must have been 30,000 plus yeah. dollars. Yeah. And, and gives people money. After right? that, subhanAllah. And subhanAllah, these are the yeah. true people of Islam, CD. Yeah, subhanAllah. Now, uh, did you... That, that actually, you gave me the perfect lead to the next question, which is the last question that I want to ask. Then we're going to have three, two or three questions from our audience who are very excited about asking you a question. But when we talk about service and the needs of people, one of the biggest needs that we see all the time, and especially on our stream here, is the, the world today is separated people, and we have a lot of mixed um, cultures and ethnicities, and people are having a very hard time getting married so you have experience with this in your community with the shabab um, <clears throat> have you come upon a formula that is really going to be the uh, biggest helper for people to, to tie the knot um theoretically i think there's things that we can discuss that would help mm -hmm. uh, but i think all of us first and foremost must realize the nature of growing up in the modern world is teaching you everything other than what you need to actually be successful in any relationship. SubhanAllah. Especially in marriage. And that's really the first point of departures. You have to recognize that. The modern world is teaching you to be selfish and egotistical. It's teaching you to that be lazy and to waste your time is teaching you to that focus on things that are not important. It's teaching you to have instant gratification and not know the blessings of patience and so forth. So every, like in on and on and on and on. So that's the first point of departures. We have to recognize that. And I think that as that people were in, in responsible for communities and then trying to that, uh, that lead a discourse of benefit for Muslims, wherever they might be, we have to recognize that we need to create training grounds for, and then let alone, I didn't even get to the gender thing. That's a whole yellow teeth. Mm. That's a whole huge can of worms. But uh, in the, 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 you know, dissolving of traditional gender roles is that in this thick of all of this mess is that people need to be trained and we can't make any assumptions whatsoever. The people even know the, smallest things that we take for granted in terms of what are needed for relationships. There needs to be training ground for men and women to learn what it means to truly be a man and a woman and to be a partner. And I, I really am almost on the, uh, I'm, I, I really think that it's almost not far time, but close uh, that we need to have several training sessions before anyone gets married. Mm, mm -hmm. what it is that they need to know. And those sessions aren't enough because it's about how you are, but at least it's a it's a starting point. Um, and then there's a lot, I think a lot of things that need to be discussed in there in terms of gender roles, in terms of the idea of responsibility, and then also too in terms of understanding temperaments, understanding that people are different, and sometimes you think one thing, but it's just their temperament, and the reality is something else, and really facilitating this for people, and. Um, I'm also a proponent of teaching younger people to be more responsible early. I'm not a proponent of postponing marriage. There's too many harms. And it wants that we know what's happening physiologically to both men and women at an age. We know what they're doing. We cannot turn a blind eye. That's ridiculous and extremely harmful. And we have to do what we can do to that facilitate in a healthy, balanced, and responsible way uh, that people getting married earlier. And it's much better to get married and to get divorced, even if there's children, in a halal fashion than to that open up the door for haram early on, which let's not act like this is not happening. You and I all know very well what people are doing. Not in high school, in middle school, and if we turn a blind eye to it, is it's totally irresponsible, and we're gonna have to meet Allah. And if we didn't try our best to do something about it, it, it the repercussions are going to be severe. So, um, having said all of that, that I think there's a, a lot of things that need to be done. I like kind of start there, but there's many more things that that could be mentioned there. 
And and this society is uh, teaching everybody to own their sexuality in every possible we, way except through marriage. Right. But if you had a high schooler, who two high schoolers getting married, it would probably be a scandal in the public school. Right. But every other possible thing is up for grabs, and we have to celebrate that. But then you have daycares at high school, a local high school here. Yeah. Friends, not have you? They have a daycare it's at high school. Wild. Right, because high school girls need to study and they're watching their kids. Wow. So, like, you have daycares at high schools in many places, and you're telling us to like not get married. I mean, yeah, it's, it's insane. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's a clear agenda. And now, with that, th thank you for taking these questions and for giving us this time. I'm gonna take two or three questions um, from the audience here, okay. Um, Let's see who we have here. Put out your questions that you, that you have for, for Sheikh Yahya. You may not have had a chance to talk to Sheikh Yahya before, so please uh, put a question out for us. Sorry, one last thing I, I did yes. want to mention. For me, one of the secrets of marriage is that if people can develop the maturity that going into the marriage, they know it's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. but they see that difficulty or difficulties that will arise in marriage as a means to grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. If someone can go in with that, I think that that is the, as at the level of mindset. Yeah. yeah and that really is a type of growth mindset. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, that's a game changer. Like that will change things for people. That's going to change everything. And also we have to revive in our community. I think our community will get stronger and we can grow bigger if we bring back the concept of blaming ourselves mm. and and nafs is ammara and we should enter and nafs al lawama and we should blame ourselves as opposed to a, a, there's a whole nother culture out there of making yourself <laughs> celebrating that you are, have been a victim yeah. and there where is the discourse that maybe i was i contributed to this problem i could actually become a victim and i picked the fight right, right. i could come up to someone to, to a, a gang of a, a guys, of 10 guys, call them all a name, then get beaten up, and then take all the pictures and show everyone how I got beaten up, only telling half of the story. Like, right. where didn't I contribute possibly to getting oppressed? Right? So it's not blaming the victim, but victims, it has less and less meaning as time goes on. Not every victim is actually what they claim to be. Right? Not every claim is a reflection of the reality. So... A lot of there's a lot of fake uh, victims, and there are a lot of yes, true victims. But you never asked, is it possible that a string of people have harmed you, and you had nothing to do? It's a coincidence. So right. that element of blaming ourselves is also extremely important. Yeah, in, in short of the cases where there is clear abuse, the best mm -hmm. relationships uh, are those that. On both sides, you strive to give them their rights and beyond and show ihsan and don't seek your rights. They strive to give you your rights as a baseline, but treat you with ihsan yeah. and never demand their rights. When you have that, mm, subhanAllah, that's how it is. Different. Question here from Virginia is, what is one thing that accelerates your closeness to Allah? And we can couple that with a question from Khadija Omar. How does somebody find a guide in the matter of spirituality. So, two so questions. Very briefly, the first is Shi'ar al Awliya Dhikrullah, mm. emblem, the quintessential sign of wilaya, of being close to Allah Ta'ala, is to remember Him. Everyone remembers often the one whom he or she loves or that which he or she loves. And the sign that we love Allah is that we remember Him often. All of us have to bring dhikr of Allah Ta'ala into our lives, the greatest way to withstand the onslaught of the Dajjalic world in which we live is to build meaning and substance in your heart by remembering Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. We're not going to be able to endure loneliness in the grave until we learn how to remember Allah Ta'ala in solitude and cultivate that intimacy in the remembrance of the in the meanings of remembrance of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala when we're alone. Bring dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into your life. And the way that you do that is to make the five daily prayers the pivot of your day. Recite the prophetic invocations in the morning, in the evening. 
what are known as the Ed-Iyatid Ahwal, the various prayers and invocations we have from the time that you wake up until the time you go to bed at night. That is the first degree to be from the Dhakirin Allah Kathirin with Dhakirat, the male and females who remember Allah Ta'ala often, and then add to that slowly and sustainably over time. And inshallah ta'ala, that will help you immensely. As for the uh, second thing, sorry, what was the second one? How do you find a guide in the matter of spirituality? Foundation of finding a guide spiritually in the spiritual path is desiring closeness to Allah. So first of all, the whole reason we take a guide is to draw near to Allah Ta'ala. Beyond the politics of different Torah, beyond that the spectacle, beyond all of that, and that sometimes some of the negative tendencies that come from people that have specific spiritual paths, we have to get beyond all of that. The whole reason you take a guide is because you want to refine your character, polish your heart, and draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when that starts to develop in your heart, and again, the way that you do that is to that bring about in it, Ya Rab, I want to draw near to you. Ya Rab, I want to come to know you. And the scholars then say, a sadiq, the one who is sincere, will find his sheikh at his doorstep. SubhanAllah. He will open up the doors. Take things outwardly that visit awliya, visit righteous people, ask people that, and ask around and then look into it. But it's a trust when you connect to a particular, te particular teacher or a particular way. Make sure that is what fits you. And you will know, just as you know in relation to the woman that you want to marry, like, or a woman, the man that she wants to marry, how do you know that that was the right one? You tend to know. How do you know that that house was the right house? You tend to know. How do you know that that jacket was the one you wanted to buy? It's something you like. You, you'll know at your heart level when you find the right person. And as long as the outward things check, then benefit from them and that put into practice their particular way of rearing you. And inshallah ta'ala, the doors will open beneath that. Jazakallah khairan. And one last question is, uh, we start off, but we taper off and we forget. What is the way that a person, especially if in the online community that may not have a masjid, may not have a physical person, we start off doing something, whether it's adhkar or classes or otherwise, and we taper off and we yeah. find ourselves all of a sudden, we're not doing it anymore. So what is your advice to someone to stay on the consistent? So if we frame this, this is what entropy is, the natural state of things to move into a state of disarray. If you don't clean your house, it's going to get dirty. And the only way to fight spiritual entropy, which is the natural state that we've been given because of we're made of clay and we're made of spirit. The clay is always going to go down to the earth. Mm. If you are not constantly fighting against that, that activating the power of the ruh, I know that sounds like pseudo-spirituality, but it's real. By way of spiritual struggle, mujahada, walladhina jahadu fina. Those who strive for our sake, Now we will surely guide them to our ways. The secret there is spiritual struggle. How do we practically that embark upon a path of spiritual spiritual struggle? Have a religious program, a structure to your life. Plan out what you want your ideal day to look like, like in a balanced way. Something that you can do in on a normal day. Don't do too much, otherwise you're going to burn out. Do something, structure your day. And again, around the five daily prayers and some of the other things that I mentioned, structure your day and then force yourself to stick to what is that you've set out to do. And the struggle that you put in is what you always have to come back. But then we have these ideal times like Ramadan. Ramadan is the ideal time yearly. And think it like think of it like this. I'm going to reset and get back to doing what I was doing, and actually more. Juma is the ideal way to do that on a weekly basis. Um, that the nighttime, and preferably before Fajr, if not before you go to bed, is a way to reset on a daily basis. And then from time to time, you're just going to lose your spiritual aspiration. This is where perform Umrah, if you have the finances to do so. Mm -hmm. That Get out of your environment. Go to a program. Go visit someone righteous. And how can, if you kind of do this, uh, then you'll get back. And the most important thing is to, every time we fall down, and even if we make a major mistake, dust yourself off and keep going. But recognize too, is that when we grow, we don't necessarily grow exponentially like this. 
we tend to grow like this and then we plateau. But if you do put the work in continuously when you plateau, you're not going to have another that time ascension. So sometimes you think that you're not growing, but you really are. Mm -hmm. And to get to that next stage, you have to get through that uh, that monotony that you're feeling oftentimes from that doing the same thing over and over again, which is not really what you're asking, but that's another dimension that's important to know. Mm. I always feel that uh, just like the earth needs to settle. When you plant something or you build a foundation, uh, they put the concrete out. They usually have to leave certain stilts in the concrete. They have to leave that for about two weeks for it to really be strong, then they could build upon top of that. Mm -hmm. so likewise, when we have these journeys, you you sometimes go up like this, but you have to set, end up going in this plateau. That's where everything's settling. And that mm -hmm. level is becoming your new reality. If nice. you always went up, you'd probably, you could go insane. Mm -hmm. If you constantly went just up and up and up and up and up, you, you'd never adjust and you could never settle down. So, it seems that that plateau part is so important, and that's what they call sometimes they say that history crawls and then it leaps, mm. and then it crawls and in a, in a new reality. That's the new reality. Then it leaps again, and a major change, but then there has to settle down and it has to become the new reality that we are all accustomed to. So, uh, great answers and great benefit for everybody here. Uh, people have been looking forward to this, and I've told people that we would eventually bring you on. So thank you so much for coming on. And inshallah, is not the last time. We will have you on again in the future uh, right. if you would honor us with that. Inshallah. You. And uh, maybe the next time around will be when we finish all of our renovations <laughs> here and we have the whole Maqasid crew come and visit, yes. then uh, then we could do something small again, inshallah. You in the location that you all purchased? That's where you are? Yeah, we're in the third floor. Nice. Yeah, oh, we're in the third floor. We have people live in the second floor. The soup kitchen is in the first floor. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and the classes take place between the second and uh, first and third. Mm. And that's in the heart of New Brunswick, right downtown. Right in the heart, yeah. Mm. Right in so, the middle of the city. So, alhamdulillah. So we have, alhamdulillah, both Sunan of the Sunan of the beautiful rural environment, which is very peaceful. And then mm -hmm. this one here where it's pretty hectic and helter-skelter. So, alhamdulillah, the community can enjoy both. And I'm glad we have both. You can't just have, alhamdulillah, two hands uh, are always better than one. So, I'm glad we have you around. That was one of the things that made me become Muslim even before, subhanAllah. I was thinking about that uh, I was in, a little bit into Rastafarianism. We wanted to go and shave our heads and grow dreadlocks and live on a farm in Jamaica. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things made me become Muslim is that when I read that Islam was the deen of fitrah mm. and it just clicked for me like with this deen you, you could live in the middle of New York City on the 21st floor of some building which is as far as possible as you could be from like a normal lifestyle mm -hmm. and have a natural and beautiful as a life as could possibly be and we are a little bit out there but this dean has to be everywhere and we have everything we need in it to have little oasis and beautiful microclimates amid yeah. the... SubhanAllah. We're the... very blessed in the area to have uh, Sheikh Yahya uh, nearby, only about an hour or five minutes away. So again, go to almaqasid.org. Find out when is the next uh, trip. Uh, take the weekend down. Uh, come from England, from wherever you are. Take the weekend out and maybe take more than that and then you could uh, visit both. You can come and visit us in New Jersey. You could go to the Maqasid retreat that you can benefit from, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming and taking your time out. I make dua for Maqasid to continue growing and for us to continue working together and being in our, each other's suhbah. May Allah ta'ala put us in this suhbah until the day that we meet our Lord. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr. إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله
Yeshiva.